Thanks very much. Um, I don't normally use this kind of microphone, so you might have to help me out. Can you hear me all right? Cool. On to a good start then. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to wait until my presentation gets up and then I will start. Hi guys, how's it going? Um, before I even get started, I just want to ask a few questions just to kind of set the pace. Um, does anybody in here play guitar or sing or play the piano? Put your hand up. Quite a few people then. That's, that's a good start. Is anybody an artist? When I say artist, I don't mean graphic design. I mean actually physically putting a pencil on paper or getting some oil paints out and there's one so far. You do still exist then. <laughs> okay, anybody design fashion? Oh no, there's zero in here, okay. Um, anybody want to be an actor or direct movies or kind of get, in, get involved in the, the technical video side of things? Zero, wow. It's actually quite interesting, okay. Well, at least I know there's some musicians in the house anyway. Um, I'm also a musician, so um, yeah, so my name's George. Obviously, you know that, you've just seen it on the screen. <laughs> um, I, I'm from Hertfordshire originally, but uh, I, run, I live, I've lived in Leeds for two years, and I run a company called Creative Industry Hub. Um, my talk today is going gonna, is gonna to be about how you can break through in the creative industries, which is something that a lot of people want to do, but they just don't know how to do it. So um, I'm going to offer some of my wisdom, and hopefully it will help the people out in here that want to do that. <coughs> Actually, how do, I, how do I flick screen? <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, so it's firstly, what is a creative industry? Um, I think ever since the digital economy has started to grow, um, you know, more and more digital jobs have been created. Uh, what that's meant is that there's kind of been a bit of a, let's say, a grey area as far as what a creative industry really is. So, you know, years ago, um, you know, a, an artist was an artist. It was someone that, like I said earlier on, put pencil to paper. Now, an artist can be someone that uses Photoshop and they can make digital, um, you know, digital designs, of, you know, working for an agency, working internally within a company. Um, so a lot of people kind of start to think, oh, I'm, I'm a creative professional, I'm a, I'm a creative industry. And although that's technically true, um, the way the government uh, refers to a creative industry is slightly different to how we often perceive it. So creative industries really are artists, physical art, they're musicians, they're film and TV directors, they're, they're actors, um, they're fashion designers, not so much the manufacturing side, because obviously that's, that's more of a retail thing. Um, so lots of people feel like they're a, a creative industry professional, whereas really they're an advertising professional. So um, the industries I just spoke about is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so a bit about me, um, I'm a musician as well, like I said earlier on, um, I studied music at Southampton Solon, graduated quite a long time ago now, that's quite a scary thought really. Um, now the biggest thing for me was that when I did my degree, I paid a lot of money, as I know that a lot of people in here would have done too, and I was not given an accurate view of what, m what I could do as a music professional, which is kind of disheartening for me really, because I, I left thinking that I knew everything about the world, everything about the music industry, and suddenly I fall flat on my face can't get a job, no one will hire, will hire me. I have recruiting people telling me I'm un, unemployable, which is not a very nice thing to be called. <laughs> so I started to think, there's something wrong here. I've just spent a lot of money and I'm supposed to be up to the level where I can go and work in the music industry. Why is no one taking, taking me seriously? Um, and the reason why is because I wasn't given an accurate view. Um, I wasn't told how the industry really is and what you're supposed to know to actually work in the creative industries. So over and over again, I heard that classic saying, which, I'm, again, I'm sure many people have heard it, sorry, we're looking for someone with a bit more experience. Um, now, sadly, I was forced to consider alternative work crews, and that meant doing things that I didn't want to do. That meant doing jobs that I wasn't interested in. So I kind of had to act and pretend to be passionate about other things, um, which I got pretty good at, to be fair. I worked in sales, I worked in recruitment, I worked in, um, you know, for working on exhibition sales, and did all these kind of different things, uh, trying to fill the void in my life that was missing from not doing music. Um, out of frustration, I thought, again, this is, this is not right. I've, I've graduated a year ago now. No one's taking me seriously. Even with this experience, people still aren't taking me seriously. So what has gone wrong? So I started to realise there was a big flaw with, with the gap, the bridge that bridges people from higher education through to the workplace. Um, and I started to look for solutions and realised that there wasn't any. So I, I basically created it. So I created Strictly Go Networking in 2013. Feels like a lifetime away now. But um, to kind of summarise, it was the most popular networking event in London for people that work in music, fashion, film and art and most of our events brought uh, very well-known speakers and more than 200 people per event to attend. Um, bit by bit I started having people contact me on social media because they obviously saw photos from our events and, but they worked in other industries such as fashion and I didn't really know much about that at the time. 
And they were saying, oh, I love the look at your events, by the way, George. Um, I'm also kind of having, having the same problem. I can't meet fashion people. I, I can't seem to get a job in fashion. What do I do? Could you help me out? So I then set up a similar event for fashion professionals. And bit by bit, I rolled it out through all creative industries. And the one thing I've learned by speaking to literally hundreds and hundreds of creative uh, graduates and professionals over the last few years is that every single creative industry is the same. Does not matter whether you're an artist, doesn't matter whether you're an actor, a film director, a fashion designer, a musician, it does not matter. There is a, a, a scary parallel between these industries. Uh, the, the main thing really is that there's a lack of support for creative professionals in the industries I'm speaking about. Um, once again, the university does not inform people of what the real options are that they have, and also it doesn't teach them the right skills. So to give an example, if you study fashion design at university, you're not really told of what your options are when you graduate, and a lot of the times, um, there's a real lack of um, jobs out there, so people are forced to set up a fashion label because obviously they have to overcompensate for the fact that they can't get a job as a fashion designer. But they weren't taught business skills at university, so they're basically starting from scratch. Um, again, all creative industries are highly competitive, and they're closed industries. It's as much about who you know as what you know. Sadly, my first business didn't work out, but I was madly passionate about this whole ethos that I'm talking about here. So um, this time last year, I set up a kind of bigger and better version of what I did before called Creative Industry Hub. And we've got a simple mission, which is to basically break down barriers for creative industry professionals. It's to teach them all the skills they, they need in life that their higher education you know, missed out on. Um, and also, I'm a great believer that it's all well and good paying £9,000 a year to go and learn a course from somebody. But nine times out of 10, you're learning from people that haven't actually gone and done it themselves. And that's why they're now a university lecturer. No offense if there's any lectures in here, by the way. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a great believer that if you really want to learn from people and you really want to get the right path, you should always learn from people that have gone and done the thing that you want to do. Um, and also, we, we provide networking as well. So, so here's some interesting facts about the fashion industry. I'll just cover this a, a little bit a minute ago. But after doing a lot of research, I found out that every year, uh, 4,000 fashion designers graduate from university. Yet there's only 500 new jobs created every year. Now, if you kind of think about that for a minute, it's quite sad, really, that, to think that universities are allowing people to spend £9,000 a year to go to university, and they don't even know this information. They don't even know. They've basically got a very low chance of getting a job at the end of it. And obviously, if they were told that from the get-go, they probably wouldn't have bothered giving them their money in the first place. So that then gives them options. Um, 3,500 have to change career, a bit like what I did, um, which I can assure you they do not want to do, because at the end of the day, they've just spent £9,000 a year. Who would, in their right mind? Or they have to set up their own label. But the problem is, they weren't taught how to set up a fashion label at university. They weren't given business skills. So there's a really high failure rate with um, fashion labels, especially in the first year. Um, so what are the options? What, really, what choices do we have as a creative professional? And, I, and I'm adamant about this. I believe that universities should take this slide and put it on the prospectus for all courses that they offer. Because people need to know this stuff, and I can't, still can't get my head around the fact that people aren't told this. So here are your options. One, work for a creative company. Again, I'm going to be very specific when I say creative industry company. I mean a record label. It could be a fashion house, you know, Spotify, Live Nation, a film studio, whatever. Um, the other option is to go self-employed, uh, session players. Um, there, is, there is no full-time job for session players, so you have to be a freelancer. There's no other choice. It's very hard to be a full-time makeup artist. You have to be a freelance to make money. That's just how it works. Um, or become a creator, which is one of the most difficult things you can do. I mean, you've got more chance of succeeding in setting up a business than you have becoming a creator that's successful. In other words, you've got more chance of setting up the next big tech startup than you have to be the, be, become the next Adele. That's, that's the numbers. Um, or start a company, um, but I'm not going to talk about it today because that's more of an enterprise business thing, and I'm sure there's many people that have spoken about it before. Um, so here's a couple of little quotes that I really like. Um, how many people like Dragon's Den, just out of curiosity? Hardly anybody. I must, I must be the only person that likes it. <laughs> okay, well, Theo Pafitis, I'm sure you've all heard of him. He's the, kind of, um, he's the, he's the Cypriot guy with the glasses, balding grey hair. <laughs> um, he's got a saying called, stack the cards in your favour. It's not illegal to gain an unfair advantage. And if you want to get a creative career, you really have to use that ethos. You have to put yourself in a position of advantage. James Cotton is observe the masses and do the opposite. He, he will actively look for trends and things that people do, and he will say, you know what, I'm going to go this way. I'm going to go the complete opposite direction. And nine times out of ten, that works. 
So how do we work for a creative company? How do we get a job in a record label? How do we get a job in a fashion house? How do we get a lot uh, job working for you know a film studio? Um, one thing that is quite important to know is that all creative companies operate the same way as any other company, um, but there's less of them. So you've got more chance of becoming you know a graphic designer than working in a recording studio. The, that that's the way the numbers work. Um, and but the, uh, one mistake that people make is they go to university, they'll do a kind of higher level degree such as music. <laughs> they'll get a degree in music. And when they get out of there, they want to get a job in music, but they're not being specific as to what they want to get. So it's really important that if, you, if you, anybody in here wants to have a radical career change and they, you know, they want to quit their jobs and work for music tomorrow, then you need to be very specific where you want to go into. You know, do you want to work in marketing for a music company? Or do you want to work in artist management or production on the technical side? Um, and if you can't get your foot in the door, there really is only one way of doing it, and that is to gain experience by volunteering. And it's kind of sad, really, that you have to do that, but it is the only way, because no one's going to hire you in, a, in an industry where there's hardly any jobs if you haven't got experience. And if that's not going to work, if record labels aren't going to give you a chance, or fashion houses aren't going to give you a chance, then the only options are work for a completely unrelated company. So, like I said, if you want to get into production, um, at, but no record label is going to allow you to do that, then maybe think of how you could... Do use those particular skills in a different area, get the technical experience that you need, and then roll it over to the job that you want to go into. And if that doesn't work, then do what I did, start a business. That's the only reason I've got experience, because I started a business and I basically gained the experience that I was lacking, and you know, as a result, I'm now employable in some, some senses. Um, <clears throat> and also establish and demonstrate authority in the creative industries. Again, there's hundreds of thousands of graduates in these degrees and people that want to get into, you know, fashion, film, music, art, but they can't even, they don't even understand what they're talking about. They have got no uh, authority in that area whatsoever. Most importantly, network. I think more so than any other industry, networking really is just a key to success. So I'm going to talk a bit about me and, um, and somebody else as well after this. Um, as I said earlier on, originally I was unable to get a job in the music industry because I had no experience. But since then I've gained a lot of experience in different areas, such as event management, sales and marketing, celebrity management. Um, I've developed a database of music industry contacts in some of the biggest organisations in the world. I've built a really good reputation amongst these contacts. Um, and also I've developed a popular news channel and demonstrated my expertise and knowledge amongst those contacts. And as a result, I now get people contacting me every couple of weeks, offering me jobs working for music startups, fashion startups, that kind of thing. Obviously, I tell them all down because I'm more interested in my own business and doing what I'm doing. But the, but the thing is, I, I've now put myself in a position of power. I have stacked the cards in my favour. And like I said, it's not, it's not illegal or unfair to do that. Another friend of mine, um, Exara Helmy, very well-known singer. Um, this is quite an interesting story, actually. She wanted to get... Um, experience working for a record label. Um, instead of waiting until she graduated, which is what a lot of people do, <laughs> for some really weird reason, she um, kind of overheard a conversation with a couple of people in a pub one day while she's in her first year at uni, which is, this is an unlikely story, and she said, oh, I'm going to go and talk to these guys, and she asked them if they're looking for anybody, and they took her on as an intern. I mean, they, 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 they weren't even looking at anybody, but they took her on just because she'd gone over there and made friends with these people, so she basically networked her way into an opportunity. It wasn't even about the experience or anything to do with that. Um, also, uh, when that internship ran out, she realised she was going to come unstuck again. She didn't want it to end there, so she started to actively call companies, something that a lot of people don't do. Um, and then she volunteered her services for free. She said, don't worry about paying me. Um, if you need anybody to come and help out in the studio, I'm, I'm your guy. So they said, OK, we'll, we'll get you in. Within a few months, she got promoted multiple occasions. She became the PA to um, two directors there. Um, and most importantly, she got a reference from every company that she worked for, which is really important in the creative industries. Um, more recently, she's landed a job as a community manager working for a, a music startup called um, Superpass. They're going to they're gonna be really big next year. Um, and this all started because she went to a network event, got talking to Katie Malua, <laughs> of all the people in the world, you know, a really well-known singer. She got talking to her, and then um, eventually that led, led to her talking to CEO at Superpass. And she basically said to her, look, I'm really interested in this job opportunity you're offering. She called her the next day. She didn't wait for her to call her. She changed the next day and you know lo and behold she got offered a job um, <clears throat> and alongside that um, I think it's fair to say that Exara has got authority in the music industry because she's played BBC Introducing seven times so she, she really knows what she's talking about she really understands the music industry very well and she's demonstrated that to her potential employees another route is becoming self-employed is anybody in here self-employed or, or is thinking that they'd like to become a freelancer okay that's probably the most hands I've had up so far <laughs> 
Okay, well, going so employee kind of works the opposite way to employment, and I'll explain that, but not always, okay? So there's sort of two angles to this. So being a freelance artist manager without experience, this is just an example that I've, that I've pulled out of a hat, really, but it's, it's near enough impossible thing to do. I mean, no one is going to hire you. Our, our artists and bands are looking for artist managers that have got credibility. They've helped X, Y, and Z band get, you know, top 10 single, play at this music festival, whatever it is. So the chances of you becoming a freelance artist manager when you haven't got experience is you just, you're being unrealistic, so you need to start being realistic. So really, gaining experience should be your first port of call. So in this case, if you are lacking experience but you want to become a freelancer eventually, I suggest put the dream on hold, I'm not saying you can't do it because obviously anything's possible, and then go and gain experience at a firm first. Build up some reputation, build up a client base on the side, and then eventually, once you've done that, then you become a freelancer. <clears throat> And if, if no one's going to hire you, then we just go back to the first slide that I showed you, which is volunteer, set up your own business, um, you know, get some experience in a, different, in a different area, and then drag that over to employment, get some experience in employment, get some credibility, and then become a freelancer. And that's, that's kind of the most, I'd say that's the highest chance you've got of becoming a successful freelancer. However, some jobs um, only work as freelancers, like I said earlier on, like it's very rare that you'll get a full-time camera operator. I mean, you, you might have a few for, you know, working for the BBC, which, let's face it, it's going to be very difficult to get a job there. Um, makeup artists, hardly any jobs out there. So these kinds of jobs, they have to be a freelancer. They haven't got a choice because um, there's very few payment opportunities. So my advice to anybody who wants to get, kind of get into this type of stuff is to have a normal job on the site. And ideally, it should be in the industry that you want to get into. So, like I said, if you want to become a makeup artist, try and work for a beauty company. Try, you know, try and work for a makeup brand. Get some experience working for something that's somewhat relatable to what you do. Most importantly, don't look for instant gratification. Volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. It can take years and years and years before people start paying you for this kind of work. Network, and tr but, but treat your, your, your side business as a real business because eventually you're going to want to start making money out of that. But um, really, it's all down to credibility. So try and build your portfolio, establish yourself as an expert. And you can do that by networking, by building up your photos. And it's kind of the same if you're, if you're a graphic designer and you want to become a freelancer. Really, it's going to be very difficult to get work until you've worked with some good clients. So do that first. Um, another case study, very good friend of mine, Jen Armstrong. She's, again, quite a well-known singer. Um, when she graduated quite a few years ago now, she did not want to work in anything other than the music industry. And I've got to be honest with you, I personally really admire her determination and her tenacity. She's got something I haven't got, that's for sure. She became a teacher. Even though she didn't want to become a teacher, she just thought, it's okay, it's music, it's somewhat related to what I want to do, I'll do it. Okay, made some money, went to America, and the first thing she did when she got the airplane was went straight to a music conference in L.A., and she started networking to her heart was content, and she built all these contacts up, and, and she started to collaborate with people overseas. And now she is a global collaborator. She's worked with loads and loads of artists. She's got, she had singles um, in the charts all over the world, Europe, you name it, she's done it. Um, but the, the, one, the one thing that makes her different to a lot of people is that she does not stop. She is except, she would do anything to make money out of music. So she's basically broadened her job title to an artist, a performer, a piano player, a singer, a violin player, a session vocalist. She does it all. Um, <clears throat> the only thing she won't do is take jobs that aren't very well paid unless she sees there to be a network opportunity because she knows that she can trade off, you know, maybe a lower pay to actually meet some really good contacts within the industry. And um, one th another thing is she refuses point blank to work for anything that's not in the music industry. So, uh, yeah, there you go. There's Jen Armstrong for you. Uh, another friend of mine, Dave Hurd, is actually my, my camera guy, uh, really good at networking. When he graduated, he realised that no one was going to hire him. Um, he was a freelance camera operator. There wasn't a chance in hell that he'd get really good paid work when he first came out. So he just went to an agency that paid minimum wage just to get him the odd gig here and there, build up his experience. But most importantly, it gave him a foot in the door. And he met lots of good contacts that he uses referrals. So he'd say, oh, hi, do you know anybody else that might need a camera guy? He'd take that person's details down and follow up. And he'd keep doing that until eventually he managed to um, work, find a, a company that was looking for somebody. He volunteered initially and then got offered a free month contract. And with the money that he made from the contract, he bought, went out and bought some, some really good quality equipment. And then that made him even more desirable because now he brings that equipment. And then from there, <coughs> he, um, what is that? What is that? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so yeah, so from there, he's now looking for a full time job, and he's actually getting job interviews because um, he's done a lot of really high profile documentaries, kids programs, but he's had to start from the bottom. Okay, here's here's the thing that everybody wants to know. Unfortunately, there is no simple answer. I wish there was. Um, most people want to become a creator. They want to make money out of the thing that they create, which is really difficult to do. I mean, do you, does anybody in here know a guitar player that's actually making money out of what they do? Okay, a couple of people. Fair enough, then. That's actually more than I expected. <laughs> um, so we, we all know the story of the bedroom guitar player, great guitar player, makes some excellent music, but can't seem to get make money out of it. Why not? What, what are they doing wrong? And I think the obvious thing is that they're not viewing themselves as a business. They're not, view, they're not viewing their creations as something that can be sold. Um, so they have to start doing that. And obviously, if, you're, if, you're in, if you fit into this category, then you need to start viewing your creations as basically a startup. That's what you are. In the early days, um, spin as many creative plays as you can. A bit like what Jen Armstrong does. She um, does a bit of session playing, does some wedding stuff, does some cover bands. Just build your portfolio, gain experience, and find ways to make little bits of money because people, are they want instant gratification. They want to have the one song that's going to be number one or it's going to have you know 10 million hits on YouTube. It's just not going to happen. If you can't make £20 out of one of your songs, then you have got no hope in hell. So you have to learn to just be realistic and say, you know what, if I could just make a little bit of money out of this and then bit by bit start to build it up over time, then you might be onto something, which is what Jen does. I mean, Jen's got a very good chance of breaking through because she's actually had music in the charts. She's making money out of what she does. She's making quite a lot of money out of what she does, more than you're going to earn sitting in an office, that's for sure. Um, so she's on her way to success because she's following these principles. She realises that she's a business. She knows that. She knows that what she's offering is a commercial asset, and she's selling it, and she's doing very, very well. And she's spinning creative plates along the way. Um, last case study for tonight. Um, two friends of mine, Adam and Jason Perry. Um, does anybody know a band called A? They were quite, they were quite big in the, in the 2000s. They had a song called Nothing. It was a top 10 single, and they've they played with some pretty big bands. Um, they're from Leeds originally, even though a lot of people don't know that. Um, they, but they moved to London in the 90s. And what's interesting about Adam and Jason is that they didn't want to become rock and roll stars. That was not their intention from the get-go. They had a completely different career path. They said... We want to set up a recording studio in East London, which at the time, you know, back in 1993, East London was a bit of a dump. It's not, you know, Shoreditch like it is these days, you know, the, the tech hub of the country. It was, <laughs> it was not a very nice place, to be fair, and it was probably the cheapest, well, your easiest chance to get on the property ladder, because let's face it, no one wanted to live there. So, but they saw an opportunity, they thought, okay, well, let's go in this horrible place to set up a recording studio, a Prince of Trust Grand, which they did. And they start getting some bands in. So bit by bit, they started getting on the phone, making some phone calls, ringing a few record labels, ringing some artists. And slowly, they built up an amazing client base and managed to get their studio booked out and um, started to make some money. And then one of them realized and thought, well, hold a minute, we, we play. We've got a recording studio. We've got really good quality equipment. We've got a whole book of contacts. Why don't we just use the contacts and use our own recording studio to record our own music and then get signed? So that's what they did. They had a bidding war. Within a few weeks, they were signed to Warner Brothers on the four major labels. Um, you know, within, after that, they were playing all the major festivals, and they, they went on for many, many years and sold many, many albums and did very well. And since then, they've written for some of the biggest artists in the country. They've had unbelievable amount of number, uh, top 10 singles and albums. They produce some really big artists. I mean, uh, McFly being an example, Don Broco more recently. Um, and they've also managed, again, some of the biggest artists in the world. So I'm going to finish on this quote. I'm not going to bother reading it out. I'm just going to stand here and look like an idiot for two minutes while you guys read it. <laughs> and then if I've got time to take any questions, then I will if I haven't. Thanks very much. Thank you.